Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mandy Sally. I'm the Chief Operating Officer here at the Woodhall Freedom Foundation. I'm thrilled to welcome you to this program that we have planned for today. We have an all-star lineup, as I'm sure you're aware, and we're gonna learn a lot from these amazing folks. Before we get into it, I just wanted to give you a few housekeeping items. Uh, the first thing is if you have any questions or comments for our panelists throughout the program, please feel free to submit them via the chat. Uh, I will make sure that I get the questions to our panelists and we'll have time for some question and answer at the end of our panel today. Second of all, I wanted to let you know that we are gonna be hanging around for a few minutes after the panel today. So if folks want to chat or uh, just talk a little bit about what they learned, we're happy to keep the Zoom room open for a little bit of time at the end of our program today. And lastly, I just want to say if you enjoyed this program today, um, please consider making a donation to Woodhall Freedom Foundation. We, pr we pride ourselves on providing lots of free, accessible programming for people, um, but we're only able to do that with support. So if you're willing and able and you enjoyed what you learned today, please do feel free to make a donation uh, via our website at woodhallfoundation.org. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to our panelists so that we can learn a little bit about how to best prepare for this upcoming election. Thank you so much for being here, and uh, I'll see you on the flip side. Good afternoon, everybody. It is so uh, fantastic to be with you today. Um, and we're going to tackle uh, some uh, hard hitting uh, topics, right? The name of this this session is called the dismantling of democracy, um, the dismantling of democracy and what's at stake this November. Um, but you'll also hear a little bit about what you can be doing, not just up until the election, but what you could potentially be focusing on and prioritizing beyond the election, right? This is this is not a couple months or a couple weeks work. This is lifetime work. Um, I am so grateful to um, be moderating this panel. I guess I should probably tell you my name. My name is Kiara Johnson. <laughs> I'm the executive director of the National LGBTQ Task Force, the oldest advocacy organization in the United States. States, and I'm based here in Washington, D.C., and I am joined by three panelists, uh, Kendra Johnson, noticing K and J, my sibling and sibling, um, who is the executive director of Equality North Carolina, the oldest statewide organization working on the civil rights for LGBTQ people um, uh, in the state, um, and Nadine Smith from Equality Florida who is the executive director of Equality Florida, the, sta the state's largest organization dedicated to ending discrimination based on sex or sexual orientation and gender identity. And Rodrigo Hang Lantanen, who is the executive director of the National Center for Transgender Equality. Um, they have very, very extensive bios and CVs. You will get links to those in the chat, but given we only have an hour, I want you to hear about what they're doing, just not about what they've done. And so to kick us off, I just wanna lay a little bit of a, a foundation and a context. We are under attack and people know it. We're seeing it in the headlines. We're seeing it in our newspapers. We are seeing it on the TV. We are hearing it on the radio. We've seen the don't say gay bill in Florida. We've seen censorship of LGBTQ experiences in libraries and in schools across the nation. We've heard about conversion therapy and, and mandates of young people being pushed into conversion therapy programs. Anti-trans bills are being introduced by the hundreds and are passing in states across the country. There is also a lack of federal and in many cases state non-discrimination policies. And this, these are just a few of the things that we, that we know about. Um, I don't know if people saw not too long ago, there was a, a, a report that came out, an article that came out about 22 Republican state attorneys general who are suing the Biden administration for requiring schools that accept federal funds for free lunch programs to comply with gender and sex non-discrimination rules. 
They want to take free lunch away from kids that identify as queer. That's what we're up against right now, right? Where is this coming from? I would argue that it is not about LGBTQ people. I would say it's not about abortion. I would, I, I would say it's not about voting. It is about power and we are tactical ways for conservatives to wrestle power away from what many are calling us, which is the rising electorate, right? We are a means to an end and they will do anything and we are seeing it in technicolor on the federal level and in our states. And so I'm gonna send this question over to Nadine and Kendra to kick us off. What are your organization's biggest priorities this election season, but also what are you seeing statewide that is giving you the most concern right now? Well, KJ, do you want to start off? No, you're already unmuted. Okay. Go ahead. All right, I'll go. Thank you. Well, you know, I think that um, the biggest thing that we're looking at is the biggest thing everyone should be looking at, and it's the title of, of why we're here. It It is the dismantling of democracy in very real ways and the collateral damage from that, um, how they are weaponizing not just our community. Um, you know, I live in a state that has become the focus of so much of the uh, anti LGBTQ legislation, anti abortion legislation, um, voter suppression strategies, and it's not an accident. We, you know, Florida is often a microcosm for the country. We have a governor who wants to be president and his path to the presidency is to usurp his one-time mentor, uh, Donald Trump, to appeal to this base nationwide. That's why we are seeing culture war after culture war uh, being lit by him. Not the issues that Floridians care about, but the ones that get him on Fox News, the ones that ring the cash register, nationwide as a standard bearer for uh, the, the kind of extremism that is uh, has been fomented, pre preceded Trump, uh, but was exacerbated by Trump. So for us, um, this isn't, we can't simply respond to each individual attack on our communities um, as though they aren't tied together in an overall strategy to dismantle democracy. And part of the reason for that Again, you touched on it, Kiera. They don't like what America is looking like. They do not, they have a very narrow view of what America ought to be. And in their America, um, it is, you know, when they start talking about replacement theory, this is the clash of the browning of America and the graying of America, where a majority white population holds mo most of the uh, political and economic power but the emerging electorate is much more diverse in terms of race, in terms of, of gender identity and sexual orientation. And this is that inflection point for our country where we decide which path we take. We either regress to the, the place that the people who say make America great again are saying, or we move forward uh, toward a country where every child is protected, every family is respected, people expect to be treated with dignity um, or the path that that uh, Trumpism has taken us down and that DeSantis hopes to carry uh, on at the national level as well. Yeah, I'll jump in and say, I just wanna underscore everything that Nadine has laid out, but I think there's another um, issue or on the hyper-local level, what we're seeing is this combination of uh, the extreme Christian right and white nationalism that is targeting the LGBTQ community. So we've had several prides or drag story hours where we have seen Proud Boys turn up to intimidate, harass, and, um, you know, seemingly want to force the LGBTQ community back into the closet or back into hiding. Um, that beyond what's happening just in the public spheres, we're seeing it in schools where kids are, we had our own don't say gay bill here this year as well, where they're um, policing identities in schools and creating a much more um, 
hostile environment for students that are already frequently the most um, susceptible to suicidal ideation. And then we are seeing also with this culture war that uh, Nadine described attacks on access to life-saving healthcare on a consistent basis. We had a bill last year that would have banned uh, gender affirming care for anyone 21 and under um, in the state. So it's creeping into adulthood. And for anyone who is affirming, we're also seeing language that is popping up um, that is calling us groomers or child mutilators. Um, and they're attacking our right to, to be in any of the systems that should serve us to access affirming healthcare. Um, and, you know, this is coupled again, as Nadine highlighted with voting rights legislation. They've been trying for years to shrink the population that's eligible to vote, to require voting IDs, to redistrict us out of uh, a critical mass for voting. And because we're also in a state going back to this white uh white supremacist movement, we're also seeing voter intimidation at the polls. Um, so it's pretty much a perfect storm. And I agree that this is not about the LGBTQ community. We are convenient scapegoats. So rather than fixing the gap that's been left behind in education um, for students that are struggling as a result of the pandemic, um, LGBTQ students are being, the blame is being laid on LGBTQ students for disruption in classroom. We're seeing banning of books. There's a focus on things that are actually not um, the, not what we need to be focused on in terms of job creation, better educational attainment, home ownership, security, all of those things. We're just targeting this minority population in order to divide the electorate and um, minimize the uh, participation of the new majority, which is that browning uh, of the U.S. that Nadine uh, referred to, and also a more progressive base that is multiracial, that is uh, queer, that is younger, that is uh, has more diverse economic background. So those are the things that we are are dealing with and just lies out and out lies against candidates on um, on the campaigns that target them for any support of any pro progressive issue. Thank you both, um, Rodrigo. I'm going to bring you in and um, similar question. But what are you seeing um, in your uh, national scope? Right, like what what are you most concerned with right now? And and what would you say is um, between now and the election is the is NCT's uh, focus. Well, first of all, thanks for having me and thanks everyone who's tuning in and thank you for ASL interpreter. I'm gonna to try to speak more slowly than I normally do because I'm guilty of normally speaking way too fast for interpretation, uh, but I will not be offended if, uh, if interpreter, if you need a signal for me to slow down. Um, but I mean, in terms of what we're seeing nationally, we're seeing the spread of these kinds of trends that Nadine and Kendra already spoke to. Um, and that might sound obvious, but the reason I spell that out is because sometimes any of us might think that if we live in a blue state, that this won't happen, that this isn't relevant. Um, and especially folks who live outside the South can kind of look down on the South and say, oh, that's a problem over there, but it doesn't happen here. And the truth is that actually these things are um, big threats all around the country. Um, our opposition is very well coordinated. Our opposition uh, purposefully workshops bills and policies all around the nation. And, you know, in the last year or two, we've seen anti-trans healthcare bills spread like wildfire. And then what Kendra was mentioning in North Carolina and Nadine in Florida, we've seen bills like that be filed um, in most of the country. I mean, some kind of anti-transgender legislation was filed in over half of the state's last legislative session. Now, a lot of these bills didn't pass, but they were still filed, and a lot of them were openly debated on the House floor as though human rights really are up to debate like that. 
So we're seeing this spread like wildfire. And it's not a coincidence that this just started in the last two years. You know, three years ago, there were, well, four years ago, there was only one or two of these anti-trans bills that really spelled it all out as being squarely anti-transgender. Then a year later, there were more. And then the next year, it was all over the place. And that is because our opposition does that on purpose. They adopt a 50 state perspective. They adopt a 50 state strategy. They workshop these bills all over the place, including in blue states and um, in blue bubbles and in blue dots in red states. Um, so no place is immune. And whenever these kinds of bills get an open forum um, and get that air of legitimacy, it emboldens them for next time. Um, and that's how we get to a place like today where let's say, for example, Massachusetts. Massachusetts has a stereotype of a perception of being super liberal, super blue. You'd think there's no problem with trans rights in Massachusetts, or a lot of people would think that. But actually right now, Boston Children's Hospital is actively getting bomb threats for providing transition-related care to young transgender people. Um, and, you know, we're, we're optimistic that Boston Children's Hospital will stay with us and continue providing this life-saving care, but they're, the opposition is putting them in the crosshairs figuratively and actually literally. And that's in supposedly deep blue Massachusetts. So it just really goes to show that an attack on one is an attack on all, um, not just morally, not just we shouldn't believe that just because it's the right thing to do, but because that's actually how our opposition plans it. <laughs> they actually purposefully adopt this 50 state strategy. They see our issues as interconnected. So we should as well. So really what we're seeing nationally is the spread of these kinds of attacks all over the country. And that's why it's more important than ever to not take anything for granted. If you ever hear about an anti-transgender bill or a voter suppression bill or anything like this introduced in your state, pick up the phone and call your legislator. Don't assume, oh, a Democrat represents me or the supporter already represents me. I don't need to take, I can take it for granted. Don't take anything for granted. Get involved, vote, call your lawmaker, do all of that. Whether you live in a red state, blue state, or purple state, it helps all of us. Thank you, all three of you. Um, what we're what you're saying, right? What happens in North Carolina and Florida doesn't stay in North Carolina or Florida, but that doesn't just apply, right, to the toxic copying and strategy of conservatives uh, uh, targeting our people, we can also take successes, right, that we've learned tactics, strategies that we're, in, that, that we're experimenting with, that we're employing, and actually replicate those. And so my question um, or my ask of you all is, talk to us a little bit about what your campaigns or tactics, strategies are right now. And, and specifically, where are you getting some traction? Where are you having some success? And when I say success, I mean that in a broad way, right? It might not be a legislative win, but it may be around en engaging certain populations of people, um, creating um, uh, more information data, right? That can be used and leveraged, right? At, on the state level or federally. Um, so Kendra, I'll, I'll send it to you um, to kick us off. Yeah, I'll start out just with good news. You know, North Carolina is not immune to its share of uh, bad bills. And we were infamous for HB2, which was a quote unquote bath bill, bathroom bill back in 2016. Um, as a result of compromises made around that bill, we were unable to pass non-discrimination ordinances um, until uh, December of 20. 20. Um, and starting last year in 2021, we, we were able to pass uh, close to 22 uh, ordinances in the state. We still have a few that are creeping in. It, uh, so we went from zero uh, protections for LGBTQ folks on the books uh, at the start of 2021 to uh, over a third of the population now having protections for uh, natural hairstyles, 
uh, sexual orientation and gender identity, and a host of other categories that were not contemplated under law. Um, another big thing about these is that they closed the gap that was left behind with Bostock. So whereas Bostock sets a federal employer at 15 or over, um, these go from zero to infinity in terms of coverage for non-discrimination. And just in terms of the way I think that that was done that I wanna lift up is that we were very intentional about working with a grass roots and a grass top strategy, sharing the information that was needed to get these passed, uh, not only with the folks who could actually pass these non-discrimination ordinances who had to write them into law, but with all the directly impacted groups like disability rights groups, the NAACP, uh, LGBTQ local stakeholders, um, and Latinx groups, right, um, in order to get to this place where everyone had the information in their hands, they could advocate, they knew, we work with the business community as well, so that they knew what these new measures would mean for them, and uh, happy to say that we haven't had any issues with any of the ordinances um, that have been filed, and that's the kind of organizing that we need politically. I think we need to also be highlighting that's what we're trying to do in this uh, in this election season is highlight sort of what's at stake and um, who are the folks who can uh, prevent bad things from happening and to also advance good legislation uh, and give people the pathways to plug in and support those candidates to get them across the finish line. At the same time, any candidate that comes to us for endorsement, we're also training them on the community about LGBTQ issues in the broadest sense of the word, uh, word from criminal justice reform to repro to immigration issues to um, gender identity, sexual orientation, cultural competency, and briefing them as things are developing throughout the campaign. So they're not only either LGBTQ+, plus, but they are pro-equality and they know how to talk about our issues and they're being informed about our issues as they happen. That's the kind of organizing I think we need in this moment um, to get us across the finish line. Thank you, Kendra. We had a couple questions um, that uh, we can answer, and then Nadine, I'm coming to you to answer the same question. Um, can you say more about what a grass, what a grass top strategy is? I'm not familiar with that term. Kendra, why don't you take that one? Sure. A lot of times people say grassroots because we're talking about the base, base level. The grass top is the people who are in the higher uh, echelon of power. So, for example. Rather than just talking to people who are directly impacted, um, which is critical, um, you have to talk to the people who are directly impacted about what rights they can attain. You're also going to talk to um, the people in positions of power and business interest and coalition partnerships to ensure that they have the information. So the grassroots is the people who are directly impacted regular smegular, you know, Americans and residents that are here and the grass tops would be the people at the top ranks of power that actually have the power in their hands to implement the measures that you're seeking to, to put in place. Thanks, Kendra. Nadine, where are you having some success? Where are you building, where are you get, gaining some traction that you want to share with us? Sure. I, you know, I think in a moment like this, it's really important that we learn from history that we understand that we've actually been here before. We saw this in Florida with the Johns Committee, our own version of McCarthy, where um, the state government, the Florida legislature purged all uh, civil rights advocates and homosexuals from our education system. We saw it again with Anita Bryant 40 years ago, where she went from orange juice spokesmodel to the leader of the Save Our Children, Children campaign peddling the same rhetoric we are now hearing from DeSantis, calling us groomers, you know, and that was a campaign that began in Florida, but quickly spread nationwide. It's important for us to remember that when she came to power, she was assisted by an organization that wasn't talking about abortion. Their big issue was that the Supreme Court had called for the integration of schools. That was a group called the Moral Majority. They bankrolled her Save Our Children campaign. So it should not surprise us after a summer of uprisings against police 
uh, murdering black people uh, at a at a moment of of you know Americans taking to the street that we are experiencing the backlash in the way we are. So it's important to put it in a historical context because we have been here before we actually know how to get out of here. And um, I think as we learn from history, here's what we know. We have to tell our own stories in the face of this level of dehumanization. When the anti-trans sports bill passed in Florida, it didn't pass through regular, through the regular uh, practice of law, I mean, of, of lawmaking. They attached it in the final hours to another bill uh, because people showed up, people told their story, people pushed back. And I think right now what we are, we're at a time when the majority of people are with us on these issues, more and more people know trans friends, neighbors, coworkers, more and more people have positive feelings about the trans community. And so what we see them do is weaponize any place where there's an, a, a gap in knowledge. If people, you know, most people uh, couldn't raise their hand and say, yes, I know a trans athlete in junior high school. It's just not the experience they've had. So in that ignorance, in that lack of information, uh, the folks we are up against, uh, instead of uh, creating curiosity and uh, causing people to say, well, tell us more. We want to hear more of these stories. They're saying, in your ignorance, eliminate anything you don't understand. Um, anything you don't understand is dangerous. And so in that, in that atmosphere, storytelling is not a luxury, it's essential. The other thing, place that we're seeing, um, you know, some important work happening is that there are a whole lot of parents who never thought of themselves as political around these issues. They just love their kids. They get their kid life-affirming um, care, gender-affirming care, life-saving gender-affirming care. And now suddenly they're going, wait a second, any book that affirms the existence of my child is being challenged in their school. They're introducing laws that would criminalize me for taking care of my own child. They are saying that politicians, not me in concert with the doctor and my child, it's politicians who make healthcare decisions for me. Um, and so um, I think another place where we're seeing a whole lot of voices who never thought they would be at the front of this fight um, are our growing number of parents and siblings who are beginning to step into those spaces. Um, and then finally, I think that, um, you know, we have to remember historically what we have used when we are in the majority to make change. We've used our economic power. That means making sure that businesses local, uh, statewide, nationally, understand our expectation on which side of this fight they will stand on. We use our electoral power. It means organizing and turning out to vote, not because every candidate is perfect, but because it is about harm reduction and protecting our community. And then uh, moral power. We've always used moral power to, in, to impact and, and uh, shape people's understanding. Because as long as the harm they do is out of sight, it can be out of mind and we have to change that dynamic. Here's the biggest success. Students are organizing in ways that give me um, a tremendous amount of hope. And it's not an accident as we look around, that we look at Iran and we look at other places where, where um, mass movements, in, even in our own history in America, that it is so often students that lead that charge. And in Florida, students organized uh, you know, walkouts across the state. They got themselves to Tallahassee to oppose these terrible laws. They went back to their campuses and began pre-registering people to vote, people too young to vote then who will be able to vote now. And they've continued to bird dog uh, the governor. And in, a, in an election in a fairly rural county, it was student advocates going door to door who tipped the balance between a Moms for Liberty candidate and a progressive LGBT inclusive candidate winning. So I, I see a lot of um, uh, hope in that, and I remember this, when the far right came after us for marriage, we saw 38 times in a row where we lost, but in each of those losses, the ripple effect began to change the conversation. And in some ways, it was their very attack on us that paved the way for us to secure marriage equality. And I believe that their attack on us right now is setting in, in motion the things that are going to allow us not only to stop them, but to move 
closer and closer to the country all of us deserve the right to be born into. Thank you, Nadine. I'm coming to you next, Rodrigo. Um, there's a question in the chat. Um, do you think the opposition will keep filing these bills until they get them passed? Is there any circumstance in which they don't get on the next legislative agenda? Um, I, I, this is a tactic, right? It is you, you take the most far-fetched thing and you play it right? You, you experiment with it. We've seen this in movements over and over again, including, right, our own LGBTQ movement. Um, but we've also seen it in a reproductive health and rights and abortion, right? Um, we've got to be mindful that we don't let perfect be the enemy of the good, right? We've got to be unafraid to fail because there's still opportunities for us to learn. There are opportunities for us to gauge where the public, right, our communities are at. It's an opportunity for us to tweak and shift, right, and apply um, to replicate things that are working for us, to stop doing things that aren't working for us. And so that's a long answer to this question, which is yes, I absolutely think they will keep keep filing these bills. You know, 15 years ago, we could look, you know, look at them side eye and be like, they are just crazy. But now these bills are passing, right? Again, similar around like six week abortion bans. 15 years ago, people were like, they're just crazy. And they're passing, right? So, so it is. Um, we've, we've, we've just. We can't ignore when we see what seems far fetched, right? No one expected there to be a big old target on marriage equality, ten, you know, five years ago, right? Um, no one expected that the Dobbs decision would uh, yield, a, a, you know, a. a, a, a retraction of Roe, right? These things that we just took for granted or some of us took for granted, right? And so we, we've we also got to be employing those strategies, right? Of being big and audacious and experimental in our tactics and also in our proposing of policy and legislation. And with that, Rodrigo, what's working? What are what's working for NCTE? But what are what what are you seeing trending as well that 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 is working? Well, at NCT and the NCT Action Fund, where sibling organizations, we've been having success with encouraging trans people to vote and to frankly get over the anxiety of voter ID laws. Um, voter ID laws have been spreading across the country. It's another threat that we face. And voter ID, you know, when our opposition writes and fights for these voter ID laws, they generally don't have transgender people in mind, but transgender people do get caught in, uh, in that trap. And that's because a lot of people don't realize that when you change your name, it's actually really, really difficult to update it on all of your documents. Um, if you've ever changed your name because you got married, um, you know how complicated it can be. And even still, the name change process when you get married is actually legally a totally separate process than the name change process that anyone else goes through if you change your name for any other reason. It's actually a different set of rules. Um, so if you change your name because you're trans, um, it can be super, super expensive. You might have to pay hundreds upon hundreds of dollars time and time again in these fees for each institution you're updating your name with. It's also really confusing. You know, government paperwork is not known for being easy. Um, so imagine doing that um, with all these different places where your name is registered. Um, and every single place where you have your name listed has its own process. It is like a maze trying to figure out how do I fix my name with Social Security Administration, with the DMV or whatever the name your state calls the place where you get your driver's license or state ID. How do you change it with your school? How do you change it with your kid's school? If you're a parent and your kids are enrolled somewhere and you got to update with daycare, every single place that has your name listed has its own process. And that includes all the government IDs. So let's say you go show up to vote um, and you show your driver's license and the poll worker says, this isn't the name we have listed. This isn't you. What do you do? 
Well, the truth is that you do have rights and you can still cast a ballot, but a lot of trans people don't know that. <laughs> um, the harm of voter ID laws is, or voter suppression bills, is not just uh, when the harm of someone showing up to vote and being turned away, it's actually the much greater harm of intimidating people from not even bothering to vote in the first place. You know, we don't know how many people just get nervous and freaked out and don't even try. That's the chilling effect of these voter suppression laws that we're seeing all around the country. And trans people are trapped in that just like many other communities are. Um, so what we're really working on at NCT and the Action Fund is helping trans people get over those barriers. Um, we have resources. So um, if you're trans or you know someone who is, we recommend checking out transformthevote.org. At transformthevote.org, there's this one pager of knowing your rights while voting. Um, so that can be super handy. We recommend printing it out or having it on your phone if you have a smartphone and bring that to the polls with you. Um, go vote with a friend. It's way, way more comfortable um, to go with somebody you know and trust than to have to do that alone, um, whether you're trans or not. <laughs> so, you know, go vote. When you go vote, go with a friend, accompany someone to vote if they're nervous to do it. It'll make the process so much smoother. And lastly, if you've changed your name at all in the last five years, check your registration. Um, because in some states, when you change your name on your driver's license, it automatically updates to your voter registration, but in some states it doesn't. Um, so depending on where you live, if you changed your name on your driver's license, it may or may not be updated on the voting rolls. And there are complicated reasons for that in each state, it's different, um, but that's why we really recommend check your voter registration. Um, it's super easy to do. You just type in your name and address and it'll tell you um, what's up. But if you change your name really for any reason, um, but especially if you're trans, go ahead and verify that on your voter registration separately. Thank you. Um, you've heard from all of our panelists, right? Civic engagement as a key right, part of transforming culture and politics and legislation. Um, we often hear, right, that folks are uninspired, right, to get out to the polls. And we've got to be doing that work, both of, of acknowledging, right, government has often failed us, um, if not targeted, uh, targeted us explicitly, and, right, to Nadine's point, history has shown us over and over and over again, right? That wrestling away political engagement is how you wrestle power away from the people, right? So we've got to remember that history piece and remembering there are ways for us to get engaged at the local, state, and national level when it comes to civic engagement. And when I say civic engagement, I'm not just saying the vote. Not everyone can vote, right? Voting, right, and it's reg registering people to vote, educating new voters, right? Also taking friends with you, family members to vote, talking with people in your community or in your family. Anybody wanna sit at Thanksgiving to talk about what's going on in our community? Sometimes that's the hardest thing to do, but sometimes the most impactful thing that we can do. But voting is often a gateway to broader, bigger, more consistent political engagement. That's another reason you see or hear many of our organizations talking about transform the vote or the task forces clear the vote campaign. It is often that first opportunity to do something, right? That can make a difference. That's not quite so scary that then, right? Inspires you to get engaged even more. So speaking of local state and national, a, a question came in, what should, people where should people prioritize right there's often um like a, a polarized way in which people talk about national and state or state and local or local and national um what should people be doing um at the local level the state level the national level um one the other or all three uh rodrigo since i've got you here i'll start with you and nadine i'm coming coming at you next Sure. Well, there's no wrong way to participate. So if there is any one uh, tactic or, or area where you feel passionate, get involved there. We, we need more hands on deck 
everywhere. Uh, but if you're looking for direction on how to get involved, voting is a great first step. Like Kiara said, that's often um, the, the entry point to further activism. Um, so make sure you're registered to vote, check if you're eligible um, and vote. Remember to vote not in just the federal elections like Congress and Senate, those get a lot of headlines, but there's all those state and local races that actually decide a lot of the things you probably really care about. A lot of um, what the government is responsible for in your daily life is really decided at the state and local level, not in the Supreme Court, and not in Congress. So make sure to vote down the ballot, you know, all, all the way down. Um, you can see what the ballot is going to look like in advance. Um, a lot of states will mail you the ballot so you see it. But even if you live in a state that doesn't send that to you, um, you can Google it and then you can see in advance all these other races that are on there. Um, and you can Google voter guide, you know, uh, city council, DC voter guide, something like that. Um, and you'll get a lot of information from other organizations like ours informing you on the candidate stances. Um, and another thing that uh, you can do uh, beyond voting um, is volunteer with your local community center or sign up with the organizations that work on the issues you care about. Sometimes volunteer opportunities come up um, in ways that are kind of specialized that might be perfect for your skill set. You know, if you're an attorney, maybe you can help pro bono. Um, if you're a chef, maybe you can help cook for an event. Um, whatever skill set you have, there's probably some kind of fit, but it might require actually talking to a human being at an organization uh, to figure out that niche. Um, and here at, at NCTE, we're getting ready to launch our US Trans Survey. It's this huge survey that's um, the only source of information for a lot of parts of trans people's lives. And we're looking for people to help us phone bank and text bank for that. Um, and text banking is great because you don't have to talk to anybody. <laughs> you don't have to worry about whether they pick up the phone or not. You're just texting. Uh, that's a lot easier for a lot of us. So you can reach out to us at transequality.org. Um, and it, you know, this goes for anywhere in the country you live, whether you're um, a citizen or not, eligible to vote or not, any age, anyone can volunteer on getting, make sure trans people fill out the US Trans Survey. Nadine. Um, you know, I it's sort of like asking, uh, should I exercise, eat healthy or quit smoking? You know, to me, all of this is the, it's a three-legged stool. And for a long time, it was, you know, when I came out, all I knew were national organizations. There weren't any state groups. There were hardly any local organizations. And as Rodrigo points out, so many of the things that were affecting our daily life were happening in state capitals with legislators whose name nobody knew and who weren't being held accountable. So I, I would say this, um, as a donor myself, I look at where, where the most tactical place is to apply all my efforts, but I need really strong local organizations. I, I need a super strong state organization, especially when so many of the attacks are coming through our state capitals. And I need national organizations to play offense and defense. But more than that, and I think the most important message to send at all times is that organizations are not going to replace individual action. And by that, I mean, there is a circle of influence that I have that no organization flyer or email or speech will reach in the same way. My personal relationships, we went to school together, we played basketball together, we we, were, we went through basic training together, whatever it is, these ties that bind. And I think in a moment like this, when there are so many things pulling us apart, um, the algorithm of our social media, uh, you know, just tells us that our worldviews are so absolutely not just different, but opposite. It becomes important for us to keep contact at that Thanksgiving dinner and online with that you know, the person who you were close to in high school or college, and you're like, what happened? Where? But not just to do it in these sort of, uh, through a political lens, but as, as human beings, you know, I, I go back to it. Storytelling has been the thing that has changed our country. Every civil rights movement has relied on us taking control of our own stories and telling our own stories. 
And it's true also in reaching out to those people who have given in to fear, who have bought into the idea that the only safe America for them is one that takes rights away from others. And so as hard as it is, and sometimes we must step back and, and protect our own peace, but as hard as it is, so much of this political work is engaging in those places that aren't, that don't feel easy, don't feel safe all the time. Um, many of us learn to do that with, with family. We've gone on that journey with our families and we got to bring that same energy into the political realm as well. Kendra, I'm going to bring you in on this question. Yeah, so I want to echo what uh, Rodrigo said about voting. And I mean, here's a fun game. Uh, you can actually look up your friends and see if they're registered to vote and shame them. Um, I just dropped a link into the voting hub. I'm a big fan of actually making a plan and making it fun uh, to vote. So get your people that you know are a little bit lackluster with the voting. You can shame them. You can actually see when people have voted. It's a great thing. Um, the other thing is um, I always say there's three ways to support local organizations. And as we highlighted at the beginning of this call, all of these issues are interconnected. So the attacks on the environment are connected to immigration, are connected to sexual orientation and gender identity, connected to reproductive justice, education, whatever is your passion, find an organization, give of your time, your treasure, or your talent. You may not be the person who um, loves to do public speaking or who's gonna be out there organizing folks. You might be a just a spreadsheet guru, or you might organize things for an organization, figure out what your lane is with that organization, give you your time, your treasure, and your talent to just be doing for the greater good in any of these progressive issues, because we're all under attack. Um, and the last thing I'll say, which also echoes a little bit of what Nadine was saying is, I deeply believe in personal activism, but also using your personal power inside of the systems that you work in. So if you are a person who attends a church that has been homophobic, transphobic, or is not fulfilling its mission of serving folks, use your power in that space. Move from allyship to, a, to being an accomplice, to having some skin in the game. If you work at a school and these things are under attack, or if you are a parent, they always hear from the, the folks who are uh, stoking fear. They don't always hear from the parents who are trying to support their kid. Um, and the same is if you're in a business that could just have better policies that explicitly state that they are welcoming of people of differing sexual orientation, gender identities, race, class, push the needle, get them to um, make that more explicit and to start having opportunities to learn about difference in the spaces that you're part of. Those are ways that you can fight back in this moment when we really need all hands on deck. Thank you. We are at the time for more questions. Thank you, Mandy, right on time at 350. We've been answering a few throughout the session, but please feel free to add others. In the meantime, I want to share a couple of the things um, some of the participants have said. Um, it never occurred to me that trans folks would have issues with voter ID laws, but makes perfect sense. Another example of how laws have broad and far reaching effects that we don't often realize. Thank you for sharing that. I am a member of the autism, BIPOC and LGBTQIA plus communities. So I appreciate what you all are saying. A shout out to Virginia students who were also recently successful in organizing a statewide walkout regarding the anti-trans policy introduced by their governor. Um, it's really easy to get um, sucked into right all of the ways we are being discriminated against, hurt, targeted, right? And 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 we should be paying attention to that, right? Like we can't we can't afford to turn away from and ignore that. And we have progressed, right? And and I think it was um, Nadine in the beginning um, 
who said, right, this is this is a back, this is a backlash, right? This is in response to success, right? Th that is what is happening right now, which means we've got to keep doing what we know we do well, which is be in community with our people and leverage that power. I've got a question. For those who don't care about LGBTQ rights, what is the overarching issue that includes LGBTQ rights, but also matters directly to them? I would, I'm gonna open this up to the, to the panelists, but I also wanna say the beauty is, right? We're everywhere. We are everywhere. So whatever the issue is for you, we're in it, right? Whether it's prison reform, right? Censorship and critical race theory. I can't, every time I say that, I'd like, I, need, I just, I'm gonna stop saying those words together. People take in like black history, <laughs> women, LGBTQ people out of, right? Out of, out of schools and curriculum and literature. Um, if you're immigrant rights work, right? Their LGBTQ people are often uniquely or disproportionately impacted, right? In a, a whole range of social justice issues and fights. Um, and with that, if I were saying a thing, I would say the title of our, of our, of our session today, Dismantling of Democracy. Voting rights, access to our pol political power is under attack and it is being chipped away from us. I, at one point it was a little bit at a time, but now it's like big chunks at a time. And we've got to really be paying attention to what, you know, where those rights are being taken away, whether it is punishing someone for feeding someone in line at the polls in Georgia, right? Or drawing district lines that completely cut a community in half to dilute their vote, right? Like what, what is happening? Who has access to power is real. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to you, Nadine. <laughs> Um, well, you know what, I just put this quote, uh, or I just tried to put this quote in the chat, because I think, I mean, first of all, um, what we know is where the attack begins is not where it ends. We understand that to be true historically, you know, Niemöller, as much as that quote is used, was actually a supporter of Hitler until he realized too late that he had empowered and emboldened and allowed the sharpening of the sword on people he didn't care about until it was there was no one around to defend him and um and so on a very in in the you know motivated self-interest in your motivated self-interest you have um an absolute uh imperative to stand up and we see this time and time again I, i'll use an exam as an example you know in florida after they banned trans uh kids from playing sports the same rhetoric they used began to be used by parents of athletes who had lost to challenge all girl athletes um, around uh, threatening them with really intrusive medical exams that were simply retaliatory uh, because that idea of policing um, girlhood and girls' bodies became um, you know, something that can just be done. Now in, there's a huge uproar because schools are asking um, girls who are playing sports to document their first period, their last period. And that information is being captured by an entity that is not restricted by HIPAA. And parents are saying, what do you need this information for? What are you possibly using it for? And in a state where uh, abortion is being banned even in the case of rape, people are going, you're using this information that you feel empowered to gather because, you, because we've allowed you to target trans kids. And now I'm worried that my daughter can come under government suspicion of, of uh, seeking an abortion based on this data. So the slippery slope you know, uh, is a very real thing. And we have to understand as Dr. King told us and, and others have, and our own lives have shown justice is, indivis is indivisible. You can't be kind of for equity and equality and dignity. 
you have to stand up in fights where you you may not have feel you have a personal stake in that issue but the power that is being amassed by targeting that group of people regardless of whether you identify with that group that power is what is dangerous to all of us Kendra Rodrigo, do you want in on this qu this question or? I know we're running low on time, so I'll keep this short. But uh, I would say so the first thing that came to mind when you asked that question of what's a unifying theme almost um, is healthcare. Now, I think you can uh, make a very reasonable and legitimate argument that any issue on the planet <laughs> is one like Kira was saying that affects LGBT people and non-LGBT people. Um, so healthcare is more just one example out of many, but it's the first thing that came on my mind because let's be real, we all know what it is like to be screwed over by an insurance company or to be um, talked down to by a doctor or to not be able to get uh, some basic coverage that we need to be healthy. And LGBT people feel that in a certain way acutely often. You know, a lot of us um, who are transgender have been outright denied care. Uh, when the doctor found out that we were trans, we might have been um, harassed by the doctor or the insurance company uh, denies our claims because they say, well, you have an M or an F, male or female listed on your ID. That means you don't need a pap smear. That means you don't need a prostate exam. Um, and then, you know, so many uh, cis, meaning non-transgender LGB people have encountered barriers in healthcare and discrimination. So those of us in the LGBT community experience healthcare discrimination in particular and unique ways. And tragically, so, so, so many Americans experience one kind of discrimination or another in healthcare, even if they're not LGBT. Um, and I think what's important underneath all that is that we can all agree that everyone should be able to get treatment when they're sick without having to worry. So there's this bedrock value. And I think that makes it a good example of how to talk about hard issues. If you're ever struggling on how to kind of break through to a relative or your friend on a topic, um, whether it's healthcare or anything else under the sun, think about, well, what's the value underneath it? Um, and if you can get to that value, like in the case of healthcare coverage, the value is that no one should have to be scared just because they're scared of being denied care just because they're sick. When you get to that value, it breaks through a lot of the other jargon and, and the BS that keeps us apart. And it makes it something much more relatable and real that we can all agree on. So um, I love that question. And I really encourage us to get down to the values place. That's what can really bring people together. Thank you so, so very much um, to Nadine Smith of Equality Florida, Kendra Johnson of Equality North Carolina, Rodrigo Hang Lantanen of National Center for Transgender Equality. Um, things to take with you. There is power in telling your story. There is power in remembering and telling our history, right? Where we've been and where we've succeeded, how we've progressed, how we've been resilient. There is power in how we spend our money, whether it's a small business or an organization whose values you believe in. There is electoral power. Put your legislators numbers in your cell phone. Just put it in there. Then you don't even have to go to the switchboard. They should be hearing from us all the time because we have a lot to say and we're impacted in deep deep ways. I want to thank you all for coming out. And I also want to appreciate Woodhull for pulling this together, wishing you all so much power and luck and resilience and soul and light and grace leading up to the midterms and definitely after them. And with that, I will turn it over to Mandy, who is going to open it up for a general socializing time from now till 415. 
Yes, thank you so much. Um, this was amazing. I feel very inspired. I learned a lot. Um, so thank you to all of you for sharing your wisdom with us today. Um, if you enjoyed the program, there's a QR code on your screen um, to donate to Woodhall. Um, we really like to put programs like this on that are free and accessible to folks. Um, and we would appreciate your support with that if you're able.